Ever since the launch of Ampere, people have been speculating about the planned existence of an RTX 3080 Ti, so to speak, between the RTX 3080, obviously, and 3090. And as of January 1st, 2021, this SKU is all but confirmed. I mean, purported leaks pointing to pretty typical naming conventions from ASUS and others suggest that a 3080 Ti does, in fact, exist, and that it'll boast significantly more VRAM than the original 3080. But why are things done this way? Why does Nvidia have anything to gain by delaying a card with seemingly better value than and comparable performance to the RTX 3090? Absolutely, they have a lot to gain. We're gonna talk about why in this video. Stay with me. Activating Windows is as simple as hopping on over to SCD Key's VIP site where you can purchase an OEM Pro key for a little over 10 US dollars. Use a secure payment method like PayPal, receive your key in a matter of seconds, and activate your OS here to remove that annoying watermark. Click the link below to get started and use my offer code GSL for a sweet discount. I want you to think back to the Pascal launch. What did Nvidia do? announced the GTX 1080 and GTX 1070. And for quite some time, these were the only two cards you could buy from that generation. The 1070 offered 980 Ti-like performance at a fraction of the price, and the GTX 1080 was at the time the most powerful thing around. But why did Nvidia do things this way? Why release two of your more expensive cards First, well, there are a few variables at play here, so let's discuss them one by one. First, we've production, yields. See, Nvidia and AMD produce these, the GPUs specifically. Boards and coolers are generally left to AIB partners and memory is sourced from usually either Samsung, Micron, or Hynix. And if we're even being more precise than that, these GPUs aren't actually manufactured by either Nvidia or AMD. Rather, they outsource this production to companies with large semiconductor fabrication plants or foundries. TSMC has taken on quite a bit as of late and was initially in charge of Pascal production as well. And this is where yields come in. If Nvidia expects, say, 50,000 viable GP104 dies suited for GTX 1080s, but TSMC only delivers half that are 1080 worthy, Nvidia might alter launch pricing to reflect the projected supply shortage. This bump would offset initial demand for the higher end SKU, forcing some buyers to look further down the ladder at the GTX 1070, which uses the same die, but one that's not as well binned. But the 1070 was already expected to be a better value at its initial MSRP, which was just under $400 at the time, and it's possible that this new demand projection far exceeds output from the manufacturer again, resulting in an even larger bottleneck. Nvidia raises 1070 prices pre-launch in anticipation of this, and the cycle continues further and further down the ladder through GTX 1060s, 1050 Ti's, and 1050s. Now, at the time, AMD's Radon division wasn't competing too much with Team Green. Vega 56 and 64 came roughly a year later, uh, but it should be noted that external threats to Nvidia's high-end cards were relatively non-existent by this point, and were perpetuated by the release of the 1080 Ti, which went largely unanswered by Team Red. So there was very minimal competition from uh, the, well, the only competition in this space back then. Anyway, this trickle-down effect on demand projections on account of production uncertainty are partly to blame for why Nvidia releases things the way it does. By choosing to release only a few SKUs at a time, the manufacturers allowed a bit of breathing room. Once fab kinks have been worked out in the GP104 wafers, they can allocate additional resources to cheaper, more affordable SKUs that end up selling much better in the long run. Case in point, check out what the most popular graphics cards are as of November 2020 according to Steam hardware surveys. The GTX 1060 and 1050 Ti are still by far the most common cards around despite being several years old by this point. And these, mind you, were released after the 1070 and 1080. So any assertion that launch order affects popularity in the long run is pretty much out the window. Another important variable in determining product launch order and scheduling is the initial impression metric, which is important to any brand and can determine momentum far into the future. So picture it this way, had Nvidia launched the 1080 at $1,000, right? Would we be talking about it in the same light today? Or I mean, even especially back then, would we be talking about it the same way back then? Probably not. Same goes for the 1070, right? 980 Ti-like performance for $300 less? That's one heck of a card, right? And that builds a lot of hype, brand loyalty, 
all the things that both Nvidia and AMD are looking for in especially a keynote. The initial impression metric also motivates companies to release their best products first, by the way. It'd look a bit weird if Nvidia flexed its muscles by announcing a brand new ultra efficient architecture that is super powerful and then you know proceeded to introduce like a 1050 Ti or a 1050 as its flagship product. Like we'd think they were trolling, especially knowing what we know about how Nvidia naming conventions work. Such an act would suggest major product issues or production issues I should say uh, at TSMC so bad to the point where they weren't even able to tease a single fully functioning high-end card at a keynote. How awful would that be? And to that end, if you're wondering about 80 series Ti scheme, Use, like the 1080 Ti, those often come a bit later because they're a little more difficult to produce. Uh, same goes for the Titan cards, uh, but one notable exception would be the RTX 3090. Obviously that came much, much later. Uh, it, it was still released technically on paper a week after the 3080, uh, but with a huge transistor bump in general comes more and more failure. And while we expect these to improve as the process matures, the costs associated with lower yields in the short run would be offloaded to the consumer much more aggressively uh, if these were the first cards that Nvidia decided to release. Heck, you're already technically paying for that, uh, and seeing as how expensive the 3090 is, how expensive the 1080 Ti still was when it launched, um, you are more or less paying for that lower yield up front. Another case in point, the Titan cards. Now the Pascal Titan X was a $1,200 graphics card that no value-oriented gamer ever took seriously when seen in light of the eventual 1080 Ti. And this ties back into the brand image discussion as well. You'll find that the sweet spot is typically in the 70 and 80 skew range uh, for consumer grade hardware. Not too steep on the price and just right in terms of power and performance over previous generations. Things are designed intentionally this way, so why Nvidia is a multi-billion dollar company. But these aren't the only reasons why companies launch their more expensive products first. Another major motivator is the fickle consumer. What that means is the, the consumer who uh, isn't too sure, isn't too specific on how much he or she wants to spend. And this is particularly the case with uh, those who have a bit more discretionary income. See, if I'm content with a GTX 1060 upgrade from my gaming PC, but I'm a bit too impatient to wait a few months for its release, I may decide to spend a bit more than I otherwise would have for a better product that I didn't necessarily need now. The only reason this happened was because Nvidia chose to release its higher end SKUs first, thereby somewhat motivating and convincing additional shoppers to spend more to have something immediately versus something weaker and cheaper later. It certainly doesn't fool everyone, obviously, in referencing that Steam hardware survey, many more people, at least according to that survey, uh, purchase 1060s, but it can alleviate the strain of demand on SKUs further down the ladder, and the effect of that is twofold. It'll pull in additional income at an earlier date, assuming Nvidia and AMD have higher margins on those more expensive cards, and it will reduce stress on the manufacturer, which in this case would have been TSMC. By the way, this logic begins to fall apart if the company can't keep up with current demand, as we're seeing with Ampere, but that generation is being affected across the board and isn't necessarily SKU dependent Ergo, I can't, out, I can't go out and buy a 3060 Ti in the same way I can't go out and buy a 3080 right now, right? So it really doesn't matter what SKU we're talking about, the entire generation as a whole is being affected. And that finally brings us to what Nvidia has been up to lately with respect to the supposed RTX 3080 Ti. We've long been speculating as to the potential uh, for a card to exist in the gap that Team Green left behind uh, between the 3080 and 3090 SKUs, most notably with respect to VRAM, right? 10 gigs for a card as powerful as the 3080. Seems like a bit of an oversight on paper, but believe me, this was all planned from the start. Nvidia knew that consumers would prefer a 20 gigabyte SKU over a 10 gig one at this performance level, and since shoppers in this price range tend to be a bit more flexible when it comes to spending, it's very likely the 20 gig model would have cannibalized the 10 gig one. Things were a bit different in the case of the 1060 3 gig SKU versus 6 gig SKU debate, uh, where Nvidia charged an extra like 50 bucks or so for three additional gigs worth of frame buffer. I actually noticed that they released the, 10, the 6 gig version first uh, as well. But uh, the small CUDA core differences aside, I think that shoppers interested in those SKUs are generally a bit more price sensitive, so we'd expect them to flock at least to a larger extent to the cheaper SKU than uh, would have been the case uh, with a 10 gig versus 20 gig uh, 3080 versus 3080 Ti debate. The 3080 is already a $700 card, mind you, ignoring scalper and supply constraints. So a $100 or so bump in price for a higher VRAM spec isn't likely to dissuade as many buyers who were already interested in this price range to begin with. And knowing 
doing this, it's possible Nvidia decided to release a 10 gig variant first in an effort to prey on consumer impatience. It's been done before and I'm sure it'll be done again. And Nvidia is not the only company guilty of this. It's pretty typical of most tech corporations actually. It's just something most people don't think about. And by the way, I threw that $100 price bump out of thin air for all we know, because that gap is what, uh, at least a few hundred dollars. They could charge 200, $250 extra for an extra 10 gigs of VRAM and what they would call the 3080 Ti. And if they're just gonna rebrand the 3080 as a 20 gig variant and offer both simultaneously, uh, then I still expect we'll be paying at least a few hundred dollars extra for that. Uh, because again, they know that people in that price range are a bit more flexible when it comes to how much they spend. So in the end, this kind of tactic is designed to maximize profit and save face, a classic English idiom with such a strong grip on public companies. Nvidia's goal is to sell products and maximize shareholder value. And to do that, you gotta ensure that you're in good standing with with the media. You've also got to ensure that you aren't cannibalizing your own products, rather giving each product its best shot at success by staggering them in such a way that they appeal to the largest audience possible. And at the same time, you want to keep your manufacturers happy as well. You don't want to put too much of a, a, a strain on them, especially when they're just starting out and producing a new uh, product for your audience. That is how Nvidia does it. That is how AMD does it. It's worked out pretty well so far. For more on this topic, be sure to check out the links below. Consider supporting us by shopping with our affiliate links and consider subscribing if you haven't already. My name is Greg. Thanks for learning with me.